This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. In our second virtual Military History Night of 2021, our CMI member and noted naval novelist Commander Fraser McKee takes us through the harrowing tale of Operation Chariot, the 1942 demolition raid on the dry dock at Saint-Nazaire, France, in which four valiant Canadians participated. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Patricia Hind-White, organizer of this event. Welcome to our CMI Virtual Military History Night, Wednesday, February the 10th, 2021. This presentation will be videotaped for educational purposes and available for viewing on our CMI YouTube channel. At this time, I would like to extend a sincere thank you to our dedicated RCMI behind the scenes team, RCMI President Mike Hall, General Manager Garrett Wright, Sylvia Lau, Event Sales Manager and in-house Zoom expert, Jim oh, Lau, event, Events Committee Chair, Eric Morse, Editor of RCMI Members News, Director of Publications, member of RCMI Strategic Studies and producer of the RCMI videos for their strong support and expertise. Following this presentation, there will be an, um, a question and answer period, and I ask you to mute your mics and hold any questions till that time. The mute button is on the left of the screen at the bottom. Click to mute and click to unmute. Our speaker, Fraser McKee, Commander, Naval Reserve, retired, was born in Toronto and joined the NCNVCR in March of 1943, serving ashore and at sea out of Halifax. He stayed in the Naval Reserves until 1978. He has written six books on the Navy and Merchant Navy and is still writing maritime and naval book reviews for several publications. Fraser first heard of Canadian participation in the raid of Nazarene from the late Ted Brown. And this led him to in research why Canadians were there in the first place on that essentially British command and the subject of tonight's talk. In this presentation, our speaker Fraser McKee will take us back to the war-torn years of World War II with the heroic story of the March 28th, 1942 attack on the dry dock at Saint Nazaire, a raid that is described as the greatest raid of all time. The cost was very high. Five, that's five, Victoria Crosses were awarded. Lives were lost and many were wounded where uh, four NCNVR officers participated and two were killed in the attack. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, welcome Fraser and over to you. I'm virtually speaking, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Pat. It's, uh, welcome to all the people. And I understand they come from a wide variety of places. It's a compliment to me and to the RCMI's history night that this goes on. It's an interesting thing, this uh, raid on St. Nazaire. It started with a telephone call. Ted Brown called me and said, Fraser, I'm in charge of the museum at Hart House. And the, uh, no, no, why, why, don't, why doesn't my, oh, that's, that's it. okay. The museum at Hart House. And there's a museum here in the center of Hart House of military sides, uh, things. And along the archway in here are a list of people that were killed during the war that had graduated from the University of Toronto, University of Toronto graduates. And the uh, first war are commemorated on, if you pass through that archway on the side in behind here, there's a list of those that were killed in the uh, second war. So the list of the names turns up like this. There's Surgeon Lieutenant W.J. Winthrop, 
RCMVR. And another one, Lieutenant GM Baker, RCMVR. And he said, I can't find anything on them at all. I don't know why they are not in the normal thing. So I said, all right, let's have a look. And why are these men's are out history easily found? It took a little bit of searching and that led to St. Nazaire in France, which is there on the Loire River. The Loire River is here coming in and there's St. Nazaire. Here's England up here in the front and here's the English Channel. And the main problem with St. Nazaire was that it had a large dry dock. In fact, it's the only dry dock in, on the Atlantic coast that will take large ships such as that. That's the Bismarck that had the fight with the hood that sank the hood in the Denmark Strait off Greenland uh, in 1940, what's the date? Uh, the in 27th of May, or the 12th of May, 1941. And in fact, the hood was aiming for the dry dock at St. Nazaire because they had managed to land a few shells in her and she needed some repairs. Churchill and the Admiralty were very concerned that the Germans had this dry dock available to them. The only one that would, would take ships that size in German hands were in Germany. And that would mean going through the Denmark Straits and so on. So this was a pretty vital place. And they decided the answer was they had to take it out. And when you're dealing with ships of that size, for instance, the Bismarck is 50,000 tons uh, and 822 feet overall. And the, the other two armored cruisers, the Nisenau and, and Sharnorse are about the same. So if you can knock that dry dock out, then you make things really difficult for the Germans if there's any damage at all. And yet they were worried that if those ships were left undamaged or could be repaired, they could really wreak havoc with passing convoys in the Atlantic. So the decision was made that they had to do something about it. But the trouble was our relationships with France were not good after the uproar at Dakar and so on on the coast where the Royal Navy had shelled the French capital ships and destroyed them. And also there was, so they, the cabinet, the British cabinet were insistent that there were to be no general bombing of French towns, which would have meant that in order to destroy the lock gates, you were going to have to dump a lot of pretty heavy bombs and they were very close to the uh, situation in France. And I'll go one more slide. There's Saint Nazaire and the docks. Now the dock, the lock they're talking about is that one there. That would take a German battleship. But this is the town here. And it was notorious that in the early days of the war, and in fact, really before the Norden bomb site was acquired, accuracy was about 10% of where you were trying to hit by bombing from a reasonable height of 10 to 15,000 feet. In other words, if you were trying to damage this, this lock here, dry dock, you're going to do an awful lot of damage in France and the British had said that was not to happen and they weren't to do it that way. So that left them with the choice of doing something else to damage the locks so the locks would not be available. Here's, here's the town of St. Nazaire. There's the lock we're talking about there that you can draw into. Here's the town itself. And you, if you're dropping bombs from 15,000 feet, you're going to smash most of the town, even if you drop them in the water. So that was not an acceptable answer. So the answer was, all right, let's try something else. The answer is, you don't want to, it doesn't matter whether you do damage a lot of things in the locks, that isn't going to hurt very much and easily repaired. But there is the critical part, and that's the lock gate. Unlike the locks on the Welland Canal, which are split in the middle and open on a hinge like a door to a room, this, lock, this gate slides to one side. It slides this way in here and it opens that way. Now you only open it at low tide and then you run your, you, you uh, uh, bring your ship in and you rest your ship on these blocks 
and you close the gate and the tide comes in and you fill the, you drain the water out and everything is fine, you work on your ship. All right, that's what their target is, that gate. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, there's a close up of the gate itself. It slides as you can see and is watertight and that's what you have to try and, and, and demolish. And here's what it looks like. I was over there in 2008. That is it, that's the target from seaward. And that's what Campbelltown that they used to blow up the lock gates eventually. That's what she was aiming for, that gate right there. And she came up the Loire River here or the estuary and rammed into that lock gate there, which was what they had to do. All right, this is a major problem. So here's where they have to go. They have to come up. This is the Loire River and this is the estuary. Here's St. Nazaire up the here. The lock is there. And this is a sandbank uh, that draws about 16 feet of water at high tide. So you have to have high tide, first of all, to make the lock gate just um, enough that the Campbelltown can hit it. And also that you can get the Campbelltown across here because you don't want to go up this channel all the way to St. Nazaire because this is guns all along the outside. There are guns over here as well. These are all guns or searchlights. You want to stay as far away as you can from them. And also all they were, the RN was prepared to provide was an older ship of some kind and a bunch of motor, wooden motor launches like that. There's one of them. And these are all made of wood. We had 80 of them in Canada, Fairmile Motor Last. They're Fairmile D class. They had a top speed of about 20, 22 knots at the most. The, mostly these ones that they took in, that's a Bofors of a type that they mounted. And there are smaller 20 millimeter Orlicans here and here in each of these fair miles, but that's about all they had. So that's what they were attempting to do. So who are the people that they went? Well, they were people that were in the commandos for the army and their job was to go ashore and blow up anything that they could in the way of pumping equipment, which would make the lock unusable even if they repaired it, as long as the pumping equipment was destroyed. So they went out into the Royal Navy and they said, all right, we're going to produce a ship and the ship they produced was uh, an old Ameri US American destroyers. We had seven of them or six of them to begin with them. Seven one couldn't get across the Atlantic, so it came back to our hands. Uh, they weren't very good, and they were gradually, by 1942, they were being replaced by the Corvettes for ocean escorts and British destroyers and so on. So they, the Royal Navy was prepared to make one available with the idea that they would ram the destroyer into the lock gates at night and then blow it up, or what is best they could do for that. And so they went out and they got the destroyer and then they assigned various motor launches and the motor launches amongst the crew had some Canadians. There's the first one that it's Surgeon Lieutenant Jock Winthrop. He came from uh, Saskatoon. His father was a dentist in Saskatoon, Paul Winthrop. He had one sister that I tried to reach but she was in an old folks home and died before I could reach her when I was writing this up couple of years ago. He took a BA and it was an odd one called Arts and Medicine. Now what that comprised of, I don't know. I haven't spoken to the university in Saskatoon and uh, from in 1936 and or at least in, in 1930 in Saskatoon. And he, he was born in 1912, by the way. And he came up to the University of Toronto and graduated in medicine in 1936. For a short while, he practiced in uh, Quebec City as a doctor. There's a graduation photograph from the University of Toronto. And uh, he, he uh, graduated uh, from, uh, from medicine, went to Quebec City, a couple of other places and returned to the, United, to the University of Toronto to lecture in medicine at the university. Uh, he joined the RCNVR in February 1941 at age 28. The other man that didn't survive the raid 
was Graham Baker. This is a painting done after the war uh, by his sister. I knew Gina Lamb, his, it was his sister. Uh, and she had the painting done for him when he didn't return, having been killed during the raid. And he also joined the RCNVR. You can see how old he was, the same, relatively the same age. He had been at the university at uh, St. Clair College in Oxford in England and returned to Canada, went to the University of Toronto, graduated in arts and then joined the RCNVR as well in 1940. He went over to England as, as uh, uh, the other the doctor did, Jock Winthrop, and they were assigned to, uh, Jock Winthrop was, his first job was assigned to the uh, uh, destroyer Campbelltown and ocean, doing ocean escorts, went up to, to Moscow at one or at least to uh, the North Russia at one stage of the game and just standard ocean escorts. Uh, Graham Baker went straight into Fairmiles. He wanted to get into MTBs and they said, all right, they consider, but in the meantime, go and serve in, the, in one of the Fairmile motor launch patrols that were patrolling around the English coast. So he was doing that and was serving in the Fairmiles at the time that they acquired them. They had made the decision to attack the lock at uh, the dry dock at St. Nazaire in, in the fall of 1941, the late fall of 1941. And by January, they were starting to accumulate what they needed, the destroyer and so on. The other people that were involved were two more Canadians. Lloyd Davies, who was, uh, he was in, he's from Montreal. He was working part-time in the UIMCA. He was taking his third year of commerce and finance at McGill and, uh, volunteered to join the Navy. He was sent over as an ordinary seaman in what were called the Raleighites. And that was lots of 25. The Royal Navy had lots of ships, oddly enough, but they didn't have enough people after all. They're not a large country by some standards and they needed people. So we agreed in Canada to send over and we sent about five lots of 25 each ordinary seamen. They would go over and they would serve they, after a brief training period in HMS Raleigh, which was the uh, seaman training base in the south of England. And they were sent off into various ships, very often destroyers, minesweepers, all sorts of jobs to fill in. If they did well, they would appear before a board and as long as they were considered satisfactory, they'd be given commission as Lloyd Davies was. He was given a commission and he began to serve as well in Fairmile motor launches around the English coast. The other person is very, uh, and that's a spelling mistake, that S shouldn't be there, he's Edward O'Rourke. He comes from the West, as far as we know, we didn't know much about him. Uh, he uh, reportedly came from Calgary and he had been a rallyite as well. He went through the rally training, went to sea, and then they nabbed him as well for the attack because the attack included uh, not only the destroyer that were, to, they were going to run into the lock gate and blow up, but the fair miles, but also two motor torpedo boats. The command boat was to be in charge of the fair, and here are the people that were to run it. That's, he was in charge of the commandos, that's Lieutenant Colonel A.C. Newman, uh, and he was a military commander and had fair, the commandos. The commandos were carried quite a few of them in Campbelltown herself to be taken off once she ran into the gate or in the fair miles that were to be run into the French shoreline around the town of St. Nazaire. In charge of the whole naval operation is Red Rider, R.E.D. Rider, Commander, Royal Navy. He was in the lead fair mile motor launch. We had the lead uh, uh, motor torpedo boat. And there was another motor torpedo boat as well equipped with torpedoes because if the destroyer was unable to ram the lock gate at the very least they hoped they could fire torpedoes into it which would might damage it to an annoying uh, amount. The ship they decided to use was that one and that's uh, the as an American destroyer built in 1919, 
the uh, the Buchanan, uh, and she was transferred to the Royal Navy in 1940. They were all brought up to Halifax. The Royal Navy manned them at Halifax and took them over to England, except for seven of the 50 destroyers, and they were fine. The trouble with these ships is that they were very fast. They had uh, turbine engines, which we weren't, didn't like that much, and they're fairly fussy, but they were very poor sea boats. They were very, very narrow. They rolled like anything. I made one trip and one from Halifax around to Digby, Nova Scotia, and I thought it was my last trip, and my poor mother, whose father was, over, my father was overseas, and here is her son going to be drowned in the Atlantic, obviously. Uh, we. We had a, the alarm bells went off and the captain came on the speaker and said, stay below decks, it's just a short circuit. And I, but I thought we were done for, but they were fine. No armor at all. The back of the, this is the bridge. The back of the bridge is open to the weather. So in, in the North Atlantic and in bad weather up to Russia and so on, uh, you were exposed to whatever weather was blowing from behind you. You had a little bit of cover in front of you, but nothing very much. And as a matter of interest, this is where the explosives were to be put. And they were invented by a, a fellow by the name of Lieutenant Tibbets, who was a specialist in anti-submarine warfare uh, and, and explosives. And he built down here, right underneath the forward, there's a forward gun here in the normal course of events. He, under two decks down, he built a steel box in which he put uh, a uh, 250 depth charges weighing well, they said 400 pounds, about 350 pounds each, about five tons of explosives in here, and then wired them to go off with a time delay. So they ram the ship into the lock gate. She gets crumbled down to about here, but this is a solid concrete and steel box into which these are all put. So that was the intent of what they were going to do. Here is a picture of one of the ones that's one of the of our uh, HMCS Columbia, one of the ones that we had in the Canadian Navy. And you can see how fairly narrow and very vertical sides and boy, did they roll like anything. Open bridge on the top. You can, this is the wheelhouse here, windows. These are just uh, shrapnel or small stuff. They'll they'd stop a, 20, uh, a 303 bullet, but that's about all. They wouldn't stop a shell or anything. There is one of the fair miles, again, a better picture of them, carrying depth charges along here, uh, a four inch, uh, at least a 12 pounder gun here. And back here, they'd have uh, Orlikon 20 millimeter guns. Not bad, except they're wood. And that was all they were prepared to provide, but they thought, well, that's close enough. Here is a picture of a Canadian one. Ours were all Q boats, we had 80 of them. And that was their normal armament, a, a 20 millimeter Orlikon. Not very much. On the way over, they would have protection of two uh, hunt class destroyers. That's uh, Atherstone or Tyndale. It's, the number's not shown, so it's, you can't tell which one she is. They were to, to accompany the Campbelltown and the whole lineup of uh, motor launches on the way over. And, and provide them any anti-submarine uh, detection. The, the British weren't prepared to sacrifice one of these somewhat better ships uh, against the locks. There is the Campbelltown being prepared. This is light armored plating. It will take uh, small arms fire, uh, maybe a bit of a 20 millimeter, here is a, 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 a four inch gun they put on, which was about what they had before, only different. And the explosives are all down here, right underneath that gun, well back from the bow, which they knew would be badly damaged. Uh, they put steel side, in, this is a, a gangway down inside. They put steel plating along the side here, along the deck, and they cut two of the funnels off. I'll show you another picture. There's what she looked like from the stern. This was to make her look like a German torpedo boat destroyer. They, they all had two funnels. They were sloped like this, and the two after funnels weren't really needed for because they weren't going at high speed. They weren't going to be going at 30 knots because the fair miles couldn't have kept up anyway. Here was all the protection the 
uh, the commandos had, they could lie down here in behind these steel plates, which would stop rifle fire and small arm shrapnel and exploding shell pieces, but that's about all. Uh, Bofors, 40 millimeter Bofors, and back here in the after bandstand, Orlikans. And, uh, uh, more steel plates there, and the commandos lay here, or they were below decks. And you're talking about 100 odd commandos below decks. The raid itself. And I'll just read a few of the statistics. It was arranged that Nigel Tibbetts, who was killed later on, of course, when, he, when they ran the uh, Campbelltown into the lock gates, all the crew and all the commandos carried had to go ashore. The commandos were tasked with blowing up the pumping equipment and doing all sorts of damage in the local dockyard area as much as they could. Then they were to be picked up by the various fair miles that went along with them. And unfortunately, Tibbetts, who had set the whole thing going by building the explosive charge in Campbelltown, was killed during the fighting in the town. Uh, it was multi-fused. It was set to explode at first light on AM on the 29th. Whether she hit the lock gates or not, even if she had been sunk, the explosives would have gone off in the harbor or on the sandbank or somewhere, preferably if, if she was sinking, they would try to run her into the shore somewhere to do a lot of damage and then explode and cause havoc and so on at the very least. Uh, anyway, it was supposed to exposed to explode at first late in the morning. He, as they were steaming up, up the channel, and I'll show you the picture later on of how they went, uh, he set the fuses at, at 23, 40, 45, a uh, quarter to 12. She was designed to hit the lock gate at 1.30 in the morning at high tide, at completely black light, as, uh, black night as far as they could tell, which it was because of cloud cover amongst everything else. And she ran into the lock gate and the uh, explosive was, was set not to go off until the following morning because they had to get everybody off. There were demolition charges set in Campbelltown stern so that when she ran into the lock gate, the charges would be set off and she settled down by the stern with her bow impinged on the gates and her stern down just about underwater. A fair mile would come up alongside the stern and take off the naval crew. The army would have gone forward, down ladders onto the lock gate and ashore into the town or into the dockyard to blow things up and generally be butters around in there. Uh, the uh, Winthrop and the uh, wounded and those that could survive were taken off by a fair mile, number 177. Beatty was captured and held by a German senior officer. And of course, he was somewhat worried that uh, at, at first light, nothing happened. There was a lot of shooting and machine gunning going on in town. You bear in mind, you had uh, quite a gang. Uh, there were uh, 630 in total. 271 got home that day. Five soldiers escaped via Spain over two months. And, and there were also in the group that landed, there were two press from British newspaper, uh, a French interpreter and somebody in what was called intelligence. And since whatever it was was secret, nobody knows what he was supposed to be doing or why he was there. Campbelltown had six officers 69 crew, normally they'd have about 125 to 140 crew. They reduced the crew as much as they could. Bear in mind, you've got uh, uh, twin turbine engines running and you're running at five speeds. You've got a day and a half steaming. You've got all the 28th until the 29th at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, and you've got a uh, four inch gun. You've got uh, 12 pounders and eight Orlicans and two 2.5 uh, inch mortars they carried, the commandos carried. The commandos, there were 80 and five troops Campbell, carried in Campbelltown, the seven officers, they were to land on the gate and attack the pump house and the inner gate. The MGB, the motor, to, motor gun boat at the front end carried torpedoes in case Campbelltown didn't ram the gate. Uh, they would, and they were, they would torpedo other targets and then two officers and eight men among which was uh, the Canadian. The fair mile, there were 16 fair miles carrying commandos, 
They had 29 officers and 257 commandos. They were to land on the old mole, which is on the way in, I'll show you later, uh, with Lieutenant Graham Baker and Lloyd, and Lloyd Davies in two of them. So that has the Canadians identified, two of them in the fair miles on each side of on the going up the river, and one in the motor torpedo boat at the front, and one carried in the uh, destroyer. They left from there on March the, the 27th uh, in, the, in the afternoon and steamed across. I'll go two clicks down. That's where they went. They left Falmouth here, followed down here, accompanied by the uh, two destroyers. And they, they ran into a, a U-boat here the destroyers drove it off. The U-boat thought the ships were going probably to Gibraltar. They, they saw the group of ships. They didn't have a chance to attack them. They presumed they were going to Gibraltar, which was rather, you see, they could have gone close in this way maybe, but then they, if they had been discovered, they might have guessed this is what they were going. So this is the way they came down. There was a submarine here uh, uh, acting as a signal to get very closely positioned to indicate where exactly where they were starting from. And they once they got here, then they ran for it straight up the Loire into St. Nazaire. That's the formation they were traveling in. The, the MTBs, one here, that's Red Riders one, and one back here carrying wind, carried two torpedoes with delayed actions on them. They had to be towed partway because they didn't have enough legs to steer to steam for, for a day and a half at the speed they were traveling at. And these are the two columns of the other fair miles. These are each are fair miles, one kind or another. Now I'm going to show you a couple. Red Rider is a rider, Commander Rider is here with the headquarters team. He has, uh, he has uh, O'Rourke as a signal, his command signals officer. That, that was, in other words, he was in charge of any signals being sent to them or they also had a French speaking signalman who could, when he was challenged, and they didn't have the codes, but they answered just, they were a convoy coming in from sea. And so they turned off the lights again, and then they thought this is fishy and turned them back on again. Uh, Campbelltown is here, and, and the uh, Surgeon Lieutenant Winthrop is in, the, in this one. This one has uh, Lieutenant Baker and their job was to land troops at what was called the Old Mole, and we'll show you the Old Mole later. These ones tended to turn in this way to, once they got up into the uh, harbor area. Uh, this one back, no, this one here, uh, what, uh, on, uh, just to remember, she was involved in the fight on the way. She got away all right. She landed her commandos. They turned and they left when they realized they weren't going to be able to pick up the commandos, the commandos couldn't fight their way back to the lake, to the shore again. So they turned away. On the way out the harbor, they ran into a German destroyer flotilla coming in, the small destroyers. They put up a huge fight until the guns in the fair mile ran out of ammunition and the, the most of the people on board were killed. And in fact, the CO of the destroyer, leading destroyer, recommended that the able seaman in charge of the pom-pom be given the Victoria Cross, which he was, which is one of the two cases during the war when the enemy recommended a Victoria Cross go to somebody for the fight they put up. And then they, 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 by that time, the, the MTB was on fire and sank. Uh, Winthrop's rescue fair mile is this one. When, they, when the destroyer ran into the lock gates, this fair mile came up. She had some commandos, they got off, they go forward, he jumped down onto the lock and go ashore and fight. And he takes off all the surviving seamen. Uh, they're supposed to be 60, but by that time, quite a few of them have been killed. And Winthrop goes into the fair mile and she turns and comes back, turns and le leaves out of, come, turns to leave out of the harbor. Uh, Davies is in, Number three, this one, Lloyd Davies. They had trouble getting their commandos ashore even. Uh, they, 
they tried to get in the shore. There was so much gunfire on the shore. They couldn't get, they couldn't land everybody. They did only put the bow alongside very briefly. And they had to back clear because they were being machine gunned as they went. Most of them were being killed. So they turned and left. As they were steaming down the Loire River on the way out, and I'm talking, they're barely clear of the harbor. They were being fired on by German 88 anti-aircraft guns and aiming across and they were all lit up by searchlights all around the harbor. And they were, his, his fair mile was hit in the, in the mast, first of all, his back was scat was covered in shrapnel from the shell fire. They, another shell took, went into the engine room and knocked the engines over and set the fair mile on fire. So they abandoned her onto life rafts and so on. And Lloyd Davies was taken prisoner. He was put in the hospital. And when I knew him after the war, he became the staff officer of York. He was still picking little tiny chips of shrapnel out of his neck. One time he came into the wardroom with a band, quite a big band-aid in the back of his neck. And I said, what'd you happen? He said, oh, it's just wartime. So he told me that when the shell had hit the mass behind them, they'd all been sprayed with shrapnel from the shell that had hit them. And he was still picking up little bits of steel that working their way to the, sur to the surface. So it was a, an exciting uh, night to say the very least. There, there's the route. Here's the last minute. These are, these are the guns you can see. These are searchlights. These are guns. These are guns. These are guns. These are heavy guns. And these are guns over here. And you're coming up. Bear in mind, it's one o'clock in the morning. One o'clock. There's one o'clock. And they, they, they're partly mine. It, it's only 16 feet. She ran aground at one stage. At least they could hear the propeller thrashing in the sand. And they kept going. And there's the lock gate. Bags of excitement, to say the least. And here's where they were going. There's the Normandy lock, more guns, more searchlight. These, these ones are lights, these are guns. You can see what it was like. This is only an opening. In all along here are submarine pens. They were already built by that time, but they hadn't been finished yet. There's the old, what's referred to as the old entrance. And here's the old mole. There's a lighthouse on the end of it here and guns along the side. This is where several four miles were to come alongside. It turns out that first of all, th there was silting along the edge of the mole here and Baker's fair mile turned in there and ran aground just clear of the jetty. He, was, he had been in charge of the Orlicans and the after part of the ship, ran forward, grabbed a rope, and tried to loop it around a, a bollard on the jetty. He was machine gunned and killed and his body was never recovered. He fell into the water and his body was never recovered. So that's identified the four of them. Uh, a, uh, uh, oh, oh, uh, Baker was killed and not recovered. Uh, the the uh, uh, doctor got away but was killed, his fair mile was sunk trying to get back down the river. It was about, about here afterwards. Uh, and then the fair mile was blown to pieces and sunk. And he, his body was recovered a few days later and buried. This is the kind of, that is a, one of the gun emplacements taken in, in 208 when I was over there, still there. There's so much concrete in here that it wasn't worth the explosion and the, the trouble of the amount of chipping away to blow, and they're still there. That's the U-boat pens. Still, they're still in operation for motor yachts and repairs. Some of them have been floored over. They've even closed doors across them, but you can see the depth of the city. This is all concrete. You drop a bomb on it. You need the ones that came later in the war, The the uh, massive bombs they use to try and drop on the turpets uh, up in Norway and in submarine pens eventually. But bear in mind, you're dropping bombs from 10 to 15,000 feet and your accuracy is still only 10 to 20 percent. Your chance of hitting that, and there, there's the landward side of the same bunker taken in 08. You can see the mass of what was involved in those bunkers across the way. 
that's a model. I have the model still. I still haven't made it of what Campbelltown looked like. The one large gun, a four inch gun here and Orlikans here and here and here and, and machine guns, just ordinary 0.5 machine guns here. And the explosives are in here. And all this is full of people apart from the engine room and and uh, Dr. Winthrop, of course, looking after the wound. He had nobody to help him. He was the only medical person on board. Uh, once they got in, they had a steward and they had some uh, other seamen helping him, but he was the only medical person on board looking after the people who were getting themselves killed. These are the sidelines plates where the, behind which the commandos were lying. And the, you can see the theoretical gunfire. That's where Baker's mole, uh, Baker's Fairmile ran into the old mole and he was killed. That's the old entrance that they put two torpedoes in there. And there's the lock that they ran into. This is the Fairmiles coming along. And this is where most of them were supposed to land. There were about five of them to come in here. Each one would carry about 30 commandos and an officer or two, and they were to blow up the pumping equipment, which is all in this equipment here. They had orders to blow up everything they could find here and blow this gate as well. In the morning, she landed uh, at, at 1.30 in the morning, 1.34 in fact, they, uh, the captain turned to the to uh, to the colonel and said, "I apologize. We're four minutes late." Uh, they ran right in the middle of the gate, like that. There she is. They blown the explosives in the stern to have her settle by the stern, and her bows embedded in the gate. This is the next morning. Souvenir hunters, as well as people with an interest. Here is a picture of what she's like. Look at the damage they've done. Fortunately here, not on the bridge. Uh, shell hole, shell hole there, more shell hole there. And all you can pick it out all along. This is all the gunfire. This is done at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, the attack of the 18 fair miles. Oh, and one more picture. There she is again taken the next morning. There was a ship in the dry dock, a merchant ship in the dry dock. There she is embedded in the, in the lock gate. You can see how wide it is. There are ladders down here from the forecastle that the commandos ran forward down the ladder. Bear in mind there's machine guns and orlicans firing at them. They ran along here, the full length of the lock gate and into the village and into the dockyard and so on. Uh, of the 18 wooden fair miles that entered the estuary, four got home. Eight were sunk on the estuary during the battle. The headquarters MGB and three were scuttled on the way back and the crews taken into the hunt class destroyers that had picked them up again because they were unable to steam and were filling with water. The uh, number 306 couldn't land her commandos on the old mole, which I showed. They transferred them to another and set off for home. She was the one that ran into the torpedo boat destroyers, had the freeze fight and, and got the uh, Victoria Cross. The MTB that was in the last of the lineup, the MTB here had four torpedoes, which she then fired into the old mole here, which is another entrance. And, and bear in mind, you've got submarine things here. The old mole is here with lock gates and she fired two torpedoes into the lock gates. They were set on timers to go off. Uh, they rather bothered the attacking force and that they didn't go off uh, at first light in the following morning as they expected. In fact, they went off a day and a half later, uh, the, the, which was rather clever, but not intended. And that caused the Germans a considerable panic who then began shooting at anybody that was moving in the dockyard area, including their own troops and the French and causing a lot of the damage. The, what they achieved, the lock gates were demolished, the gate moving equipment was demolished, the pumping equipment was demolished, and the inner, inner gate was also damaged.
so that the lock became unusable and they achieved the aim. There was a lot of fighting going on in the town as the Germans reacted very quickly. The Air Force has been blamed, and there's a quite a good book uh, on the air attack. They were told they were not to indiscriminately bomb the area. They were to fly over, attack if they could, and that the Germans would therefore all go into the their dugouts and, and bomb shelters during the attack, uh, the air attack. The trouble is there never was a proper air attack. They, they only flew over it and got cloudy. Nobody bombed. So the Germans stayed on the surface, were manning all their guns. The only thing that worked for the attacking force was it was pitch black, dark and cloudy. And except for what they could see with their searchlights and fire at, that was their only way to prevent the attack once they realized what was happening. They, they were, they, one, a signalman here on the bridge of Campbelltown on the way in uh, answered a challenge. The lights were all turned off again for three or four minutes, which gave, and bear in mind, you're, they're traveling at about 18 knots, a fair, a fair turn of speed. And so they were pretty well up. And by that time it was too late, she was almost on the dock. The uh, people got ashore and Sam Beatty, who had been in charge of the naval uh, operations from Campbelltown, got ashore, came ashore and down the ladders on the lock gate, got involved with the fighting with the army and got captured, uh, unwounded. And he was being held in an office in, in the village or in the town of St. Nazaire the next morning. And the, the colonel that was uh, to, uh, talking to him said, you know, you really didn't think a, an elderly destroyer run into a gate like that would be much trouble for us. We'll have her hauled off there without any trouble at all. And just as he was talking, that happened. She blew up. Now, the, nobody knows, and Tibbet was killed, so he can't say uh, why the explosive that had been set to go off at first light about eight o'clock in the morning, 7.30 in the morning, didn't, but did go off at about 10.30 in the morning, blowing the lock gate to smithereens like that. There's Campbelltown. She was washed in. This is the, uh, the, uh, new, the old lock, inner lock gate from the inside. And it's all earth on the outside. No, I'm sorry, that's the outer lock gate. They put the gate, build a, a solid gate in there. And you can see this is taken from the air. Here's all sand and gravel built up on the old gate. The in gate, inner gate also all blocked off. There's again the remains of Campbelltown and the remains of that merchant ship that were there as well. And they had blown up all the pumping equipment on the thing. We're looking here, there, I'm sorry, that's the outer gate. That's the gate that she rammed into and then was blown in here. This is the inner gate, but also damaged by explosive. All these buildings here were damaged by explosive put in them by the commandos. There's the old lock gate there and that they torpedoed, put the torpedo into the lock gate and then it blew up on the, on the late in the morning at 10.30 the next uh, day and later, which caused all the mayhem. There's another view inside the gate. Campbelltown washed in and being demolished the air photograph, St. Nazaire today. There's her gun from the forecastle, which they rescued and put in a, a monument uh, to Cannon, the destroyer, Campbelltown, on Persia, La Cajon, the, the uh, Joubert, they called it, the lock. And there's the monument to the people that were killed. There on the monument is uh, Winthrop, only he's, w, he's WJ, not WS. That's just a small mistake, that's not very vital. There is a model they have in one of the U-boat pens that is being used now for boat repairs and so on. A very nice model of Campbelltown that you can get a better idea of what she was like when she ran into the lock gates, they put the explosive here on the stern 
for demolition charges. And, and you see uh, small rafts that theoretically they could get away on. And Winthrop got into one of these apparently. People say they saw him working on some people that were injured in the raft with them and they never saw him again and his body was never recovered, which is rather sad. This is the cemetery where Jock Winthrop, uh, I'm sorry, Jock Winthrop was, his body was recovered. It's one of these tombstones along here. Ross and I were over there at a little place called Skublak, uh, about uh, three or four miles. His body was found on the beach by some French and they, they quietly took it up and buried him here. And then it turned into a Commonwealth war grave. And if ever you get a chance, as many of you will know, these are beautifully handled. The whole, <clears throat> the whole system is beautifully handled by the Commonwealth War Grave Commission. Uh, and this is one of the little cemeteries. They have huge cemetery time caught from the first war. It's thousands, uh, but they are beautifully handled and it's well worth everything we spend on it as a memorial to the people that survived or didn't survive. There's his tombstone, HMC, HMS Campbelltown, 28th of March, 1942. Now, and Graham Baker. A few statistics, uh, some vary slightly from one book to another on the web. I'll show you some pictures of the various books that I suggest. Uh, 345 Army, 575 Navy, and two press. One destroyer, two MTBs, and 16 Fairmount. 168 were killed, 27%. But that's better than, than uh, Dieppe uh, two, three or four months later. 104 Navy and 64 Army. There were 215 made prisoners of war. That 60% uh, didn't get home. Five escaped. They had planned and everyone was given a map and so on and told, well, if you can't get taken away by your rescue fair miles, which that system didn't work very well at all, uh, head for Spain and Five of them eventually got home quite a long time afterwards. There were five Victoria Crosses went to the three commanders and to the uh, two to the sailors and to a, a sergeant in the army were awarded on behalf of all those. Those two were awarded to stand for all who deserved them. You may remember that only the Victoria Cross and the mention in dispatches can be awarded posthumously. You can't get a DSO or a DSC or a conspicuous, conspicuous gallantry medal. You have to be alive to get it. So there were 59 of them awarded, but they were all only to people that survived. Anybody that get killed, no matter how brave he was and what he did, could only be awarded a Victoria Cross or be mentioned in dispatches. And actually, um, the, the uh, R2 Baker and uh, uh, Jock Winthrop, both were mentioned in dispatches. Uh, one one uh, was when MTB was sent home a little early and others were yeah, scattered and so on. The names, as I said, are there. You can go next time you're passing through under Hard House, one name on this side and another one on the other side here. And you'll, next time you'll know a little more about them. Uh, on the side of the, uh, German U-boat pen, there's still signs, Durfang uh, Verboten, uh, entry forbidden, uh, and uh, passage not allowed. And with the description that far, I always put this picture in because uh, it's one of my favorite pictures. That's HMCS La Halois in the, in the river at Liverpool, uh, similar typical working class uh, Canadian warship, and I always think it's a lovely picture of a warship uh, under working conditions. They were very good at anti-submarine by the time we got into it and got good at it. We were but warriors for the working day. Our gayness and our guilt were all besmirched <coughs> with rainy marching in the baneful field, but by the main, our hearts are in the trim. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of the attack on St. Nazaire. And if there are questions, 
I'll try to answer them. I wasn't there and not very many people who were there or survived. There's presumably a few of them still around. If there still is somebody, knows somebody that was around, I'd like to talk to him, but uh, to see if he confirms what I've been telling you. Over to you. Um, anybody with questions, please, uh, now's your time. Pierre Tayon. Hi, Pat. Hi. Yeah, I graduated from the University of Toronto actually in 1955, but I, I remember uh, quite a bit of the story on this primarily, and it's a tremendous job that Fraser did putting it all together. Was it very successful afterwards? Did this keep all the, the German master ships right out of the harbor and so forth and away from that area? Yes. We, did, we spent so much money building it up and blowing it up and a beautiful job professionally yeah. done. But on the other hand, was it successful from our point of view? Yes, the RN considered it was very successful. The number of casualties uh, was not unusual for uh, what went on. Uh, there were 168, 104 Navy casualties, of which our, our two were two of them, uh, and 168 from the Army. Uh, that uh, is, is rather gruesome, but that was considered, under the circumstances, it was fully successful. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. The whole dock, uh, dry dock, and pumping system was destroyed and the Germans were never able to use it for anything, even repairs from then on. It wasn't repaired until 1947 when the French rebuilt the whole thing, but uh, they considered it really was very successful. Uh, it was too bad about the casualties, but being hard hearted, that's a lot better than there were in a lot of the army battles where they were mowed down fighting up through Italy at Ortona and so on. The casualties to take the town of Ortona were far greater than than 168, I can tell you. The ship that you were referring to, is that the La Halois? Yeah, the last one was, yes, La Halois. La Halois, yeah, I served in La Halois way, way back. So did I. Thank you. One day, but just oh, briefly. Did, eh? <laughs> just yeah, we went across to Nice Toulon Can. We were young kids, 17. And I think it'd be, it'd be good for people trying to join the Navy today. We yeah. were 17-year-old kids. We went to Nice, Toulon, Canville, Franche, on board HMCS, La Lois, your, and, your the Monty, would, and the Crescent. Yeah, your skipper wouldn't have been much more than that, you know. He probably That's would be true. in his early 30s, responsible exactly. for the fighting yeah. efficiency of the ship. Yep, true. It was a beautiful ship. And they took good care of us at Nice too long. We walked down the pr promenade and it was beautiful. But yeah. it's a wonderful example. Today we have trouble getting people in the service. And these are advantages that we had in our generation, I guess. Yep. Thank you again. It was wonderful. I, I believe there's a, a question from John Fotheringham. Go ahead, John. You there? Yes, yeah, sir. Pat. Um, thanks, Fraser. I'm um, just wondering. And you may have answered it, and I apologize if I didn't catch it, but how did the raid affect all those submarines act, are operating out of the pen? Not, uh, not, practically not at all. They could get out. First of all, they repaired the old lock gate by mid-war sometime, in other words, a year or two later. But they could also get out through down through the main part of the harbor. Let's see if I can go to a picture. Uh, yeah. Submarine pens are here, and you can come out through here, but it's fairly difficult, and they're quite small. It wasn't near the old way was out here. This turn this was turned into a, a a defensive lock. You could push a submarine into here, and you could bomb it till you're heartbroken without hitting it. But once they got in here, they were also safe. But a submarine could get in and out of here still, so it had no effect on them at all, really. It it was only to destroy the heavy ships, the battleships and the battle cruisers, Scharnhorst and Nisnow, that they were the worry. The, the British in the Battle of the Atlantic felt they could cope with German destroyers and eventually submarines, but they really couldn't be sure of being able to cope with those heavy ships because they couldn't get their heavy ships to where they were needed fast enough. It was part of the trouble. But uh, yeah, but it didn't affect the submarine war really at all. Any more questions? Now is your time. I was just asking the one, Pat, uh, or Fraser, about, uh, I know a number of the Fairchilds were constructed in Georgian Bay, 
Yeah. Uh, was it not possible to make them from material other, other than wood? Was it an expense or was it trying to get them out really quickly? Yeah, and to trying to make use of, first of all, it had to be something that could be made on the Great Lakes because you couldn't make anything as large as a frigate, anything larger than a Corvette and a Bangor minesweeper in the Great Lakes. So to, to make use of the boat yards, there were all sorts of boat yards. There was another one at, at, uh, at Windsor and there were a couple of other ones around. And in Toronto, there were several made down here by uh, in, in the Toronto shipbuilding uh, and the Jimmy Francis Cini's old shipyard. But it was making use of what was available and also because you could put a small gasoline and well, two, two gasoline engines in them. There were also gasoline engines, which was bad. The Germans used diesel in their e-boats, which was far better. And I'd love to talk to somebody who served in uh, British MTBs or gasoline powered and the the German e-boats were better sea boats and they were five knots faster, which used to annoy Tony Law excessively because when the Germans decided they weren't going to play games anymore, they were going to leave, they left. And he couldn't even catch them with his gasoline powered MTB, which was much more dangerous and not as good a sea boat, but he did the best he could. But it, uh, the, they were, it was to make use of what was available in those shipyards. They were made, they were, they were double laminated mostly oak and pine and so on along the sides with oak frame and so on and some steel as well. Steel across the stern, I think. But it was to make use of what was available. Thank you very much. That explains it. And Bill Law headed up one of those, did he not, Fraser? Yeah, we had one here at York when I was one. I went, I went with it to Len Stupart all the way up to uh, up the uh, up to the Trent Canal to into Ottawa, with we couldn't get right into the city. We could only get into Dow's Lake and turn around and go back down. We had to take the mast down and anything that stuck up in the air to get underneath bridges and so on. But uh, yeah, near, nearly everybody who served at York in the '60s and and earlier '50s and '60s served in HMCS Rainbow as we called it, she technically she wasn't commissioned. She was uh, serving as a tender to HMCS York, but we called her HMCS Rainbow. Right, yeah, they, were very, they were quite a good ship. They were a good ship for that kind of thing. And we had 80 of them. So a hell of a lot of Canadians served in them. That's why these guys that went over into these other ones to the British ones were, uh, this was old hat to the Canadians to, as they are uh, people that were administering it uh, knew that these guys could do that and then they'd be good at it because they had experience from the Canadian ones. The people we sent over didn't have any experience. They learned from zero. They were starting from nothing. Is there, is there any, uh, any insight why they returned to a different port than the one they left from? Uh, no, but it may have been. Well, I think they went back. I think they went back to Falmouth again. It was rather interesting because when they arrived back here on the way back, they only the four of them that got back, the rest of them didn't get back at all, except for the all the people in the two destroyers. I think they were, Falmouth is pretty small point. Anybody from England can tell me whether they, in those days they had a, a good hospital or not, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, they were probably heading over here for uh, Plymouth or somewhere like that, where they'd have major hospital facilities. Well, for instance, Hasler's, is, is just here, the huge ARN hospital. And most of these people coming back would be wounded, a good portion would be wounded. And they were in a hell of a hurry to get them ashore. They were met by RAF ambulances and the ambulances were booed by the local crowd who already were talking to the people on board who complained about the Air Force. All the Air Force did was stir everybody up, get all the guns and the searchlights manned. And as soon as they arrived, they, everybody was at their gun and were all ready to fight them. And they felt that was the Air Force's fault. There's a, quite a good book on, I forgot what it's called, I'll give you the name, about the, uh, about the Air Force part in it. And th they said that they were restricted by, they weren't allowed to bomb the Tom. They couldn't bomb unless they could see. They flew and they didn't know they couldn't see until they got there. And then they found they couldn't bomb anyway because they were told they weren't allowed to bomb unless they could see their target absolutely for certain and could be sure of hitting it, not drop anything on the town of St. Nazaire. So that was the problem they had. And so the, 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 the people in the Navy getting back all complained that the bloody Air Force let them sound again, but it wasn't really the Air Force's fault. Partly it was the fault of the weather that nobody can complain, 
but I don't know why they didn't go back to Falmouth, except I would guess they were looking for better facilities for badly wounded people. Okay, I'll tell you the two best books I think I find. There's a book by Commander Ryder, published in 1947, called The Attack on St. Nazaire by Commander R.E.D. Ryder, BCRN, uh, prefaced by Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Charles Forbes. Uh, it's, a, it's a small book, but it, it tells it as it was at the time, as he saw it in 1947, before we knew really what had gone on in the German side or what had happened and we were able to track what each person has done. There's another book that just came out a few years ago in 1990, 1998 by James G. Dorian, D-O-R-R-I-A-N, called Storming St. Nazaire. And it's very good. It's a very detailed look at exactly what happened to all these various people, uh, both the commandos, and it's a little heavy on the commando side because he goes into what they did after they got ashore and how many of them didn't get ashore and how many of them were killed and how many captured and what happened, what they went to prisoner of war camps and so on. But uh, the, and the Air Force lost four aircraft, two crashed on landing back in bad weather and one was shot down, one of them, crashed into another aircraft, a German aircraft was attacking. He turned right and the, the, the attacking aircraft turned right as well and ran into him and crashed and the crew were all killed, which seems a bit unfortunate, but that's the way life goes. Those as the, anyway, those two books are really the best. There are probably a hundred books in total. You'll find all sorts of them. Those are two very good ones. And I like Commander Ryder's one particularly because he tells, this is what we knew this is what we thought we knew. This is what we didn't know. And this is what happened from when I saw it from from my MGB on the way in and the way out again. And so on. It's, it's very good. And Dorian gives a very good story of the whole, the whole thing. Any other questions? Well. There we are. Ace, well, I want to thank, well, I've just got one word. Outstanding presentation. Outstanding. Thank you, Fraser. And uh, well, it's really bravery under the most horrific conditions. And uh, thank you for bringing it to light. Thank you very, very much. I'm so. I don't, I don't think those two guys whose names appear on the Hart House Tower should be forgotten. They, they did quite a job under really tough conditions, and it was pretty heroic. And they weren't entitled to anything except to mention in dispatches. I don't know. Uh, I think that's a bit unfair, but maybe not a Victoria Cross. So that's the problem. The problem is with the award system. Well, I tell you, it's uh, an amazing story. Uh, I thank uh, you all, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation. I look forward to seeing you again. And um, with that, if there's nothing else to be said, I declare this meeting ended. Thank you all. Good night. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.